can't tell, sorry, okay. <laughs> I don't know. Fifth hour, how are we doing today? Good, it's Friday. Who has eaten lunch so far? Some of us, who's waiting for lunch? Me too, yeah, yeah, we're hungry. But we are super excited for this hour. We have some amazing staff readers, but before we get there, a quick shout out to my fifth hour in the back over there, hello. Amazing, thank you. That's the energy we all need to bring today. Um, quick thank you to our boosters. If you know somebody who is involved in our boosters, please give them a quick shout out. Thank you at home, wherever they might be. Also, thank you to the English department, Mr. Anderson and Mrs. Ank for organizing this amazing week. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to tech back there for keeping us all connected and lit and that you could hear us, all those great things. And thank you to you all for being an awesome audience throughout this week. Fifth period has brought the energy, so keep that up today. Um, we we have some fabulous ladies back here that are going to be sharing some great stories. So um, please give them your full attention. Put away your devices. Make sure you're listening. Don't nod off, right? Um, we are going to start with Mrs. Fritz, followed by Mrs. Morano, and then Mrs. Lutis. So give them a warm welcome. Hi, everybody. How are you? Um, Thank you, thank you for letting us share with you. It's very humbling to have something personal to you, have people be willing to listen to it and to sit for it, so thank you very much. Um, I had a big birthday this summer, so I spent some time thinking about the last decade of my life and some of the highs and lows and just snapshots and moments of what had happened. Um, so I decided to give you just memories of the last 10 years. And I also think this is a writing practice, like if you have to do an assignment after Writer's Week with your teachers, you could take like a year and just do little vignettes, memories, snapshots, moments from that one year. Or you could even go through like, this is my kindergarten picture and here's a paragraph of a memory I have from kindergarten and then here's first grade, second grade. Put it all together and you might find that some of those things become larger um, pieces as well. A couple things you need to know to fully understand. My name is Andrea. Um, Paul McCartney is a member of the band The Beatles. You need to know that. <laughs> and Marie Antoinette was a queen of France who was executed during the French Revolution. So a bunch of random stuff coming together here. This is called A Decade of Circle and Song. I'm 31. I live with my parents again, squatting in my little brother's old bedroom with the fish wallpaper, the fisherman paintings, the mounted singing fish, and the fishing net draped over the window. I've been caught in this sea of post-divorce life, and it's time to begin again. I move through most days like a ghost, grieving invisibly. Dad is downstairs watching TV. It's his musical idol, Paul McCartney, sitting in the center of a circle of baby grand pianos. Paul is telling the stories that go with the decades of songs. Then the musicians at the pianos encircling him play those songs. Dad starts explaining to me what he's watching, and as he is talking about the circle of pianos, the stories, the music, and Paul, he's taken by something I never saw as a kid. He chokes up and his voice cracks as water rises to his irises. In this moment, I see my dad. He is the one who caught me in a windfall at that time of life when necessary sadness was softly working like hooks woven through my mouth's tender corners. I listen to Paul in his nest of pianos and watch the back of dad's peppered head while Paul gently chirps. Blackbird singing in the dead of night. Take these broken wings and learn to fly all your life. You were only waiting for this moment to arise. I close my eyes and sink into a song that suddenly makes all of this make sense. I am the one standing in the center of a circle of pianos. And as I tell my tale of the last few years, one of aloneness, overgiving, undertaking, one that ends with me lying on a bed in a fishy blue room, there is dad playing one of the pianos that are around me. And beside him in the circle is mom at another piano. And there's little brother next to her with my best friend on the other side of him. 
I spin around and everyone is there encircling me at a piano, helping me tell my stories. As I sink deeper into this vision, I notice that standing in front of each piano is a different version of me, each one at a different age, facing me in the center of the circle. I am inside a circle of all the Andreas. I'm 34. Today is my birthday. It's the summer when Paris is mine. I am alone, filled with the longing of being alone in the city I love, the city of love. I am learning to love. I am loving the sound of metro breaks as they slide into the sweaty Station du Louvre, pistons pumping as Parisians push the doors open and crowd into packed cars. I am loving to say pardon and merci and je peux avoir un vin rouge. I'm loving midnight laughter from the cafe below my bedroom window and the times that I forget to hold my skirt down when I walk over a street vent. I'm loving the mustached Frenchmen of Montmartre playing La Vie en Rose on their accordions, cases open, catching coins from passersby. I am loving renting a bike, tying my scarf to the handles, and flying like the Nike from one end of the city to the other alongside the Seine. I have no one else to learn to love but myself. This is the thing that I will always be learning. I'm 35. My best friend Aaron and I are sitting in my car at the dawn of autumn. It slips out of my mouth, the secret I can't take back. I'm kind of in love with Jonathan. I nervous giggle. He's the most unexpected person for me to find myself in love with. And yet, it was always him. He moved through my life like a shadow, secretly following me, but never quite catching up until I gathered enough pieces of myself from a shipwreck 12 years in the storm to recognize my fleshy heart again. I admit to Aaron, I'm scared. Oh, Andrea, she says, I love you. She takes a thoughtful pause. And also, I sort of knew this already. We sit cocooned in silence. Her acceptance holds me. She continues, you can't choose how you rediscover who and how to love. You deserve to just love. You deserve to be happy. Happiness and deservingness had been hiding comatose in a closet underneath embarrassment, worry, and other people's ideas about what's okay for me. Maybe it's time to open the door again and believe that I deserve to be and am wholly accepted and loved. It's time to trust me again. I release my breath and myself. Aaron and I drive to the closest store down the street, Target, and buy a pretty but ambiguously scented candle called Rainwater Lily. On old receipts from my glove box, we write out our fears, which we take with our candle, to the dead back of the parking lot and burn. Flames curl around the charred edges of those fears. Truths devour the untruths of ourselves that we carry. And then it's done. As ash floats up into the night and Sarah Bareilles belts about being brave from the car radio, we leap and run over asphalt like kids who've just been released from the punishment of no recess their whole lives. I'm 36. I no longer view my body as an empty vessel because it is full as can be with a baby. My body is again a ship, this time carrying a child who is the sum of truths told and love realized. Aaron and I are at a Florence and the Machine concert. My back is killing me, my feet are swollen, and the hippies around us smell of patchouli and body odor. The daisies trampled at our feet are smashed into puddles of beer. But none of that matters, because Florence has flown off stage and is running around the floor barefoot among us, her yellow silk dress trailing her like victory as golden confetti pours from the ceiling. I remember last Mother's Day when I fell to my knees in the shower, glittering water pouring over my head and down the drain as I pleaded through tears with my hungry body. I want to be a mother. I want to be a mother. I want to be a mother. Now, Florence sings out in reckless celebration. 
Happiness hit her like a bullet in the back. She hid under corners and she hid under beds. Run fast for your mother, run fast for your father. Run for your children, for your sisters and brothers. The dog days are over. The dog days are done. Can you hear the horses? Because here they come. My unborn son kicks me hard in the left rib below the heart. I laugh. I cry. I catch my breath and tuck square slips of confetti into my pockets. I'm 38. I'm pregnant again. But this baby is not ready, and she decides to end before she really begins. I lie in a ritual bath of lavender oil and pink rose petals, doing my best to love us both as I send her back with grace. I think of Marie Antoinette, who, also 38, was guillotined. Veins of blood flowed around cobblestone and stained mortar at the Place de la Concorde from all that spilling and dropping of heads. When she entered France on a clear May day at 14, they paraded Marie Antoinette through Strasbourg, backlit, backlit by fireworks, on her way to meet her prince at the Palace of Versailles. She was set like a delicate little macaroon atop a boat. Then she split through the Rhine River, petaled red with roses. I wonder how to catch a girl cleaving so unexpectedly down a rose petal river that you can't tell if this is her birth or funeral. As I bleed out my baby, I wonder how we move through this river together. A phrase that Aaron wrote into a song years ago echoes in my memory. A late, late bloom is worth the waiting. Baby will bloom again somewhere, some way. I will bloom again. The best blooms are those whose blossoms shock us like fireworks among fallen leaves and frozen earth. I'm 39. Jonathan and I are getting married today. Our parents are here, my brother is here, Aaron is here, and our son toddles around in a white short suit that my mom made, one that my brother wore when he was two. Christian's chestnut eyes mirror his poppies. Father and son fuse into two versions of the singularity of my ever-learning love, exposed in the sun. Today, I am not afraid. The musicians are piping Irish jigs on mandolins, fiddles, and flutes. It's May 21st, and my bouquet is a fragrant cascade of white roses. I'm 40. But really, I'm 40 and 30 and 21 and 11 and 5 and 3. I'm eternally standing in the center of a circle of pianos where every story and its song matters. Every note fits, the soft and dissonant. All the time I've spent stalking the earth for the places where the Andreas hide matters. In lucky moments, I hear myself singing around me, a testament to the richness of lives past and future. There I am, a spunky, sequined kid at her first ballet recital. Over there, our skinned knees and a stolen kiss on the playground. There's my hair tangled up in a dorm room nightmare. And there I lie in another hospital bed, blinded by both too much light and beauty. Then time blurs away, and it's just me and dad and Paul McCartney in my childhood living room, silently singing out our souls together. Blackbird singing in the dead of night. Take these sunken eyes and learn to see all your life. You were only waiting for this moment to be free. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Now I would like to introduce my fellow English teacher friend and mama to be, Robin Morano. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I don't. <laughs> I don't have a fifth hour, so shout out to everyone. Cool. Thanks. 
All right, let's do this. When I was in first grade, I was the shortest kid in my class. My peers towered over me, jeered at me, made me feel even smaller than I already was. When we played games at recess, I was always picked last for teams. I once asked to join a game of kickball and was told I could be the ball. I made it my mission to show them all. I worked hard every day and soon became the smartest kid in class. I could finish a math minute quiz first every time. I could measure in inches and centimeters. I could double knot my shoes. And at night, instead of sheep, I counted syllables. My, I know, my academic prowess was my doorway to fitting in. Finally, midway through the year, I was accepted. I had friends. So when a new kid moved to school and joined our class, maybe you'll understand why I was wary. The new kid's name was Vladimir Voskoboynikov. He had thick, shiny curls and bright eyes that glittered like the mane of a My Little Pony doll. He wore wool cardigans, a beanie cap, and neon orange sketchers. He smelled like hazelnut. He could whistle. When he smiled, he kept his lips shut to hide his buck teeth, which only further emphasized his two perfect dimples. When we met, he formally stuck out his little pink hand for a handshake. I'm Vladimir Voskoboynikov, he said. And six-year-old me, looked him right in his sparkling eyes and said, you look like an asshole. <laughs> now, I had only just learned that word and I didn't fully know what it meant, but that didn't mean I was wrong. On his first day in class, Vladimir Voskoboynikov beat me in the math minute quiz. He chuckled and shrugged, oh, I like math. During writing time, he wrote a poem about sea urchins, which our teacher hung on the board. While the class clapped our syllables, he laid his head on his desk, having finished the worksheet before the rest of us even began. He didn't take notes the whole day. He didn't need to. He had a photographic memory. At recess, the kids argued over which team captain would get to pick him first. By spring, I had a new mission. Take that little genius down. In April, I got my opportunity, the annual first grade spelling bee. I began to study the dictionary voraciously, crushing juice box after juice box. I wrote difficult words on slips of paper and taped them around my house to study. I made my brothers quiz me every day. By the time the day of the spelling bee arrived, I just knew it was my destiny to demolish Vladimir Voskoboynikov. The first graders lined up on the stage in the cafeteria, and as the rest of them picked their noses and whined about having to spell in front of a crowd of parents, I remained quiet, meditating over Latin and Greek roots. The first few kids were out in mere minutes after shameful misspellings. Drive, D-R-I-V, incorrect. Yellow, Y-E-L-O-W, incorrect. Phrase, F-R-A-S-E, incorrect amateurs. I moved on to the intermediate level without a hitch. Glamorous, G-L-A-M-O-R-O-U-S, correct. Stratosphere, S-T-R-A-T-O-S-P-H-E-R-E, -E, correct. Liquify, L-I-Q-U-I-F-Y, correct. My spelling game was on fire. The echo of my voice in the microphone fanning the flame of my confidence. I was 10 feet tall, unbeatable, invincible, indomitable, I-N-D-O-M-I-T-A-B-L-E. <laughs> and soon only two spellers remained on stage, me and Vladimir Voskoboynikov. My time had come. But Vladimir Voskoboynikov was no spelling noob. He had come prepared. That photographic memory of his meant he only had to read the dictionary once to memorize spellings. As we moved into the final round, I steeled myself to spell like I had never spelled before. They moved to advanced words this time. Indict, phosphorus, orangutan, cantankerous, trichinosis, T-R-I-C-H-I-N-O-S-I-S. -I -I Too easy, I thought. I got this. But Vladimir Voskoboynikov still hadn't even broken a sweat. 
Soon the host began to eye the clock. The teachers were fidgeting on the side of the stage. The parents were getting restless in their seats. The spelling bee needed to end. The host stepped away from the podium. My God, I thought, are they going to announce a tie? A tie calamity, C-A-L-A-M-I-T-Y. I worked for this, damn it. I will stay here all night if I have to, or at least until my 8 o'clock bedtime. But then the host was approached by none other than my first grade teacher. I watched as she whispered something in his ear. Surely she was saying that we deserved more time. Surely she was on my side here. Surely she knew just how much I was owed this victory. The host took the podium again. He leaned into his microphone. Was that a flash of self-doubt I caught in his eye? With a shaky breath, he announced our next word. Spell Voskoboynikov. If I had known any other swear words, I guarantee this would have been the time they would have come streaming forth in a wave of rage. My mouth dry, I approached my microphone. My hands suddenly went clammy. My knees threatened to buckle. My head was spinning with the injustice of it all. Voska Boynikov, I heard myself squeak, no longer triumphing in the echo the mic produced. V O S K A incorrect. My world froze as I stepped away from the microphone. I watched in horror and held my breath, hoping against all hope that the genius that was Vladimir Voskoboynikov would misspell his own last name. Of course, you know the ending. He got it right. I watched him smile, a full smile this time, buck teeth and all. I watched him become the hero of first grade, the smartest in our class, nay, in our whole school. I watched him become more and more popular at recess as the days went by. We continued to attend school together through junior high and high school. In fact, in high school, we were in nearly all the same classes. And I watched as he became student body president one medal after medal with our high school debate team, never took a single note in any class, but still aced every test, while I worked so hard to get into college, to fight for the dreams I wanted, to be seen. Years flew by. One day in my early 20s, I popped into a Starbucks in the city, and in front of me in line, you won't believe who it was. Vladimir Voskoboynikov, I said, getting his attention, and he turned to me. And there was nothing but confusion on his face. I waited for the moment of recognition, but it never came. My arch nemesis for all those years had no idea who I was. It's, it's Robin, I said in the same undignified squeak that had once overtaken me during that fateful spelling bee. From school? I'm sorry. He shook his head, seeming to his credit genuinely apologetic. I don't really think about those days anymore. In that moment, all the hatred I had built up for him over the years disintegrated. I felt the sheer silliness of it all. Here I had been so so competitive and he had just been living his life probably just trying to get by just like the rest of us looking back on this now i realize there must be some kind of moral here maybe it's that we need to learn to let go of grudges and move forward with our lives maybe it's that the competitive drive to be perfect in school is not worth it Maybe it's that we're all just doing our own thing and don't need to worry so much about what others think about us. Or maybe the moral is that Voskoboynikov is spelled V-O-S-K-O-B-O-Y-N-I-K-O-V. Damn, that feels good. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Dude, right? I don't want to mess up. Next up, we'll hear a story from Mrs. Courtney Ludos. Mm. 
Hello, everyone. I was told I had to give a shout out to my fifth hour trig pre calc class. Where are we at? <laughs> All right, so um, I'm a math teacher here, right? So it would be amiss if I did not involve some numbers in my speech, right? All right, so this one is called Jake by the Numbers. I like numbers, okay? It's a pretty obvious statement, seeing as I teach math here. But seriously, numbers make sense. They're not up for interpretation. They don't judge. They don't change. They're black and white, cut and dry. Numbers are there for you. They've got your back. But not everything is black and white, cut and dry. Not everything is clear cut, consistent, non-changing. So I'm going to tell you a story by the numbers, but it's not going to be cut and dry. It's not going to be clear cut, and it completely changed me. Zero. The number of people in this audience who know this whole story. You've heard the phrase, you never know what someone's going through. And this is a prime example of that. Some of you who have been in my class before know part of it. Okay, but even some of my closest friends don't know the whole story. Two. The number of babies my mom had the day I was born. For those of you not keeping up, that means I'm a twin. My brother Jake was born first, and then I was the second twin born on February 15th, 19-something. I'm not letting you do the math on that one. We were born a year and a day after my sister, so my parents basically had three kids in one year. Sorry, Mom. Being a twin is special. It defines you from the moment you're born. I always had someone to go through life with. We had our own language. My sister was the only one who understood it. She would translate for my parents, usually lying to get something that she wanted. My sister's right here, by the way. Jake and I beat each other up. We drove 24 hours to Disney World, and by the time we got there, we all had bruises up and down our arms. We challenged each other. It's impossible to avoid competing when you're a twin. Everything was a competition. Who could run around the house the fastest? Who could throw the ball the farthest? Who could swing the highest? Who could get better grades in school? Let's be honest, that wasn't a competition. <laughs> and while we competed for everything and annoyed the heck out of each other, we also had each other's backs. When we were in third grade, my family moved. We handled changing schools together, not knowing anyone but each other. We supported each other when kids were mean. He threatened to beat up the kid who called me an Amazon in middle school. Amazon, Adam Johnson, seventh grade. I ran off every one of his girlfriends in high school because they weren't good enough. We played one-on-one -on, -one on the driveway, I lost. We played pig in the driveway, clearly won. You're never alone when you're a twin. And I always knew that he was there, going through life with me. 18, the age we were when we went to college. This was the first time we'd been separated. While we were very busy in high school and worked together all the time, we still lived in the same house. We went to the same high school. We hung out on the weekends. In college, I played basketball at Marquette, and Jake played baseball at only Central College and later McKendree University. Our schedules in college did not allow us to see each other very often, but we still called each other and texted frequently. I always felt a sort of protectiveness over him, and I'm sure he felt the same for me. I knew that what I wanted to do with my life, I knew what I wanted to do with my life from the moment I entered college. Jake was not as sure, and he went back and forth between several careers before deciding on criminal justice. He would eventually become a prison guard at a juvenile detention center in Rockford, a job that he was proud of and passionate about. He truly made a difference in those kids' lives, and I loved nothing more than when he would call me and tell me a crazy story from his day. 17.3 million. The estimated number of adults in the United States that suffer from depression. Jake was one of them. If you didn't really know him, you never would have known. He was quick to joke, he was extremely sarcastic, and he was an avid Packers, Brewers, and Bucks fan. But outward, outward appearances mean nothing. Jake had a lot of anxiety and at times crippling depression that set him into downward spirals that he had difficulty managing. He would get on weird sleep schedules and go to the gym in the middle of the night. He would shut himself off from friends and family. And even when we reached out, he was reluctant to accept any help. 
Jake was not a let's talk about our feelings kind of guy. But despite his best efforts to avoid it, he did start seeing a therapist on multiple occasions. However, he would go inconsistently, and once he started doing better, he would stop, saying he didn't need it anymore. He tried several different medications, but didn't like how they made him feel, and he would stop taking them without us knowing. What I'd like to, while I'd like to think that I knew him best, I know that there were parts of him that he simply didn't share with anyone. Like I said, he wasn't a fan of talking about his feelings, and he would never be the first one to reach out and say, hey, I'm struggling. He didn't want to inconvenience anyone, so he kept it to himself and did not let on how much he was indeed struggling. One seven seventeen. At 3.30 a.m. on January 7th, 2017, I received a call from Jake. Hearing your phone ring at 3.30 in the morning is never a good feeling, and seeing Jake's name on my phone made my heart stop. I'll be honest, at this point, any time I got a call or text from him, my heart stopped. I was living in a constant state of anxiety. We talked. He hung up. And that was the last time I talked to him. That was the last time anyone talked to him. Because he drove his car into a semi-truck and he died at the scene. After he hung up, I called my mom and dad, my sister, Jake's friends, and I waited. I paced, I cried, I threw things, I went downstairs, made coffee, did schoolwork to take my mind off the excruciating waiting. I waited over two hours for my mom to call and give me the news. I dropped the phone, fell to the floor, and my husband consoled me. I don't know how long I stayed there, but when I finally got up, my first thought was, now what? I just get up, keep living, take a shower, eat? None of these basic human needs felt basic anymore. None of them felt necessary. I had no clue how I was supposed to just go on and live in a world where my twin, who I'd never lived a second without, was no longer a part of it. My next thought was about my daughter. Five months. That's the age my daughter was when my brother died. This was both an incredible blessing and an incredible curse. My daughter, Quinn, is the reason I survived. I have no doubt in my mind that if I did not have her, I would not have handled this at all. You want to know why? Because I didn't have a freaking choice. When you're a parent, you don't have the luxury to worry about yourself because everything you do is for that kid. So when I eventually peeled myself off the kitchen floor and thought, what now? I had a strong voice in my head that says, you keep going for Quinn. She needs you. She was five months old. She couldn't do anything for herself. So I threw myself into being her mom. It was something that I could do. That was the blessing. The curse of losing your, bro your brother when your daughter's five months old, though, is you don't have the ability to grieve. I didn't have time. I became one of those people who pushed down their feelings. It was a matter of survival. It was a matter of getting through each day, each hour, each minute. It was a complete self-preservation move, but it worked for me. I have two young children now, and the absolute hardest part about losing my brother has been losing out on the opportunity to see him be an uncle to my children. I have a picture in my house of Jake holding Quinn when she was a week old, and I will cherish this picture for the rest of my life. I know exactly the type of uncle he would have been. He would have given them anything they wanted. He would have told them their mom is crazy, and of course you can have three bowls of ice cream right before bed. <laughs> of course. He would teach them all about baseball and how to correctly throw a ball, insisting I was doing it wrong. He would have been at their sports games and school concerts. He would have been fun Uncle Jake, and it hurts so much to know that he will never know them, that he will never see Quinn rule the world and Sam be his silly, not a care in the world self. My heart hurts for them that they will not know him. Five, the number of collegiate athletes that died by suicide between March and May of 2022. The pressure put on student athletes by themselves, 
their parents, their coaches, and their schools, it's extremely high. They're expected to perform at a high level in their sport as well as in the classroom. A lot of times the most successful athletes are the ones who struggle the most with mental health. They simply cannot carry the burden of the high expectations that are put on them. As a coach, I feel an added responsibility to check in with our athletes and make sure that even the ones who seem fine are handling themselves okay. Some athletes also encounter an identity crisis after their playing days are over. Often athletes are defined by their sport. It's who they are, it's what they're known for. And when, their identi when that identity is no longer, it can be difficult to figure out who they are away from their sport. I remember after my last college basketball game, I really struggled with not constantly having some workout, practice, or game to attend. I, however, knew what direction my life was headed. I was getting married right after I graduated. I was gonna be a high school math teacher. I was gonna coach basketball. Jake had a harder time figuring out who he was after baseball. He'd always been an athlete. When baseball was over, he didn't know who he was. And while he did eventually find a job that he loved and it gave him purpose, I do think that this identity crisis contributed to some of his mental health struggles. 988, the new suicide hotline number. You can call or text anytime, day or night, and someone will be there for you to talk to. This is why I'm telling you this now. Immediately after Jake died, I knew, knew in my heart that I was in a job, a position where I had the responsibility to share this story. I knew the position I'm in as a high school teacher and coach is the perfect position to talk about these things and help the students and the athletes that I care so much about. I haven't been ready. Every year since Jake died, I have thought about the responsibility and how I can make an impact on all of you. But every year it was too hard. It was too fresh, too painful, and too much. Every year I felt guilty that I haven't done more about this. Every day I feel guilt that I didn't do enough for Jake. But this year I had a feeling that it was time. I was ready. I was ready to put this story out there. This has been impossible to write. And reliving those moments after Jake's last phone call is something I have avoided. Every day those moments pop in my head and I push them down in order to survive. But I know that pushing those moments and feelings down does not help anyone. It doesn't help me process my grief and doesn't help those around me learn that it's okay to not be okay. It's okay as an athlete to struggle. It's okay to not be perfect. It's okay to tell those around you that life is hard right now and you need them. You are not an inconvenience. You are simply human and all humans need a little help now and then. 555, the number of seats in the Colsey Auditorium. That's 555 people who know, need to know that the world is a better place with them in it. 555 unique, amazing people who need to keep living, who will leave their own print, footprints on this world. 555 people who matter. Thank you. Let's give all three of our speakers one more round of applause. Thank you, ladies. It takes a lot of courage for anybody to come up here and share their story. So thank you so much, all three of you, for sharing. Um, do we have time for questions? Mr. Anderson, Mrs. Zank, do we have time for questions? Questions? Yeah? yeah? Okay. All right. So anybody out here have questions for any of our speakers? Anybody? Nobody? Really? No questions? Okay, I have one. So when you are writing, oh, is there one? <laughs> yeah, what's your question? Um, 
So how long did it take you to write your piece? Well, six years in the making. Um, I kind of just sat down and did it one day when everybody was out of the house and it was quiet. It probably took me like two different settings, couple hours. Um, but like once I like got all the words out, then I like met with Ms. Gerber who helped me organize it. It took me a little bit, but it was like once I got it on paper, like I feel, I'll be really honest with you guys, I feel a huge weight off my shoulders right now just getting this out there. Like I'll be honest, like no, some of my friends don't know like the, the whole story. So being able to share that with you today was very therapeutic for me. So I really appreciate you listening. Okay, but yeah, in short story, a couple, couple hours. Other questions? Yeah? I should reach out to people to help me. I don't have any editors, and I, I probably should have asked Ms. Gerber for some <laughs> advice. <laughs> you vulnerable? I also don't have any advice here because this is my first year ever doing Writers Week because I have very severe stage fright. Um, so I was terrified to just like do this at all. So I just kind of word vomited onto paper and uh, that's pretty much it for me. But hey, y'all try it. Cause you know what? I have crippling stage fright and it wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was gonna be. So we hope to see y'all up here next year. I think we have time for one or two more. If not, I've got one queued up. Anybody? Yeah. Is this a true story, Mrs. Morano? Yeah, all true. You can look them up on Facebook if you can spell it right. What's up? Did we keep talking? Of course not. What? No, I hate that guy. Um, but he's doing, he's obviously really successful in life. Good for him. He's like a CEO of some big company, whatever. Bye, Vlad. He goes, also, he goes by Vlad now because he's like cool. Ugh. Be a Robin, not a Vlad. Other questions? Anybody? Yeah. Mr. Murano, did you always have stage fright? Yeah. Did you always have stage fright? Yes, I uh, have diagnosed anxiety and also severe stage fright, which are two different things. Take speech class to learn about it. I've lived with stage fright, yeah. I've lived with stage fright my whole life and uh, I combat it, adapted to it, and you can too. Take my speech class, I'll help you out. <laughs> Thank you, Fifth Hour, have a great weekend. Yeah, we'll see you next time.